Five years ago, on December 27, 1974, 21-year-old Joanne Coughlin of Youngstown disappeared. That night, she apparently met her fate, and tonight, five years later, the Coughlin family is still searching for answers and something called justice. Her toothpaste and toothbrush was still in her apartment. She had trimmed a Christmas tree and bought all kinds of trimmings for it. She had all her packages laying under the tree. I just, I just know that she's not the type that would just pick up and leave her mm -hmm. family for no reason at all. It just doesn't, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Something is wrong. I think about her every day and I think about the situation, but what are you supposed to do when nobody will help you? They say time heals all wounds. Well, it, the wounds healed, but it isn't totally healed yet after five years. December Journal. Whatever happened to Joanne Coughlin? An exclusive investigative report of 33 Eyewitness News with News Director Jack Bowe and reporter Andrea Wood. Good evening. Tonight we look back exactly five years ago to December 27th, 1974. That's the day Joanne Coughlin of Youngstown disappeared. From the time of Joanne's disappearance first became public knowledge, reporter Andrea Wood has been following that case. Tonight, we'll report some of her findings. Jack, as time continues to pass, it becomes more and more apparent that the police probe into Joanne's disappearance is riddled with inconsistencies, discrepancies, and clues that were never fully pursued. For the Coughlin family, the lack of criminal prosecutions is a bitter pill that they still refuse to swallow. The last time the Coughlins saw Joanne was Christmas Day, 1974. Well, we were all together. We went over to Ruth's for dinner. That's my other daughter. And when we got there, Joanne was already there. And uh, she come and she give me a kiss. And we all had a nice big meal and everybody was eating and laughing and joking. And, Mrs. Uh, Johanna Coughlin, her husband Lyshen, and their daughters Louise and Mary Jane all remember having a good time Christmas Day 1974. A close-knit family, the Coughlins saw each other often. And then after we all opened our gifts and everything, why then we play, started to play Tripoli. We played till about 1.30 that night. And she started packing up some of her Christmas gifts to take with her. And she says, I have to go to work tomorrow. And I says, oh, do you have to work tomorrow? And she said yes. And she packed all her things and she went. The next day, Thursday, December 26th, Joanne Coughlin reported to work at the Thoroughfare Distribution Center in Austin Town, where she was employed as a Kelly girl. On Friday, December 27th, the day she disappeared, Joanne's friends at work noticed nothing unusual. She seemed happy as she talked about her plans for Friday night. Uh, she had said that she wanted to go to a, the health spa. She was excited she had taken a membership at the health spa. And right after work, she was gonna go there for her first visit, I believe. And she asked me if I wanted to go also, but I told her I had different plans at home and I, I just turned her down and didn't go. After leaving work, Joanne Coughlin went downtown to do some shopping. She bought a blanket for her bed, mailed her life insurance premium, and met a friend, Greta Schultz, who lived in the same apartment building. It was on the day that she disappeared. I was around uh, 4 o'clock, she came into my office, and uh, she was meeting my daughter down here, and uh, they had some things to discuss. So they made arrangements uh, here in this office that uh, she was going to go to the health spa, and then she was going to meet her boyfriend. And after that, she would come back to the apartment, and Greta and her were going to go to a party. And I believe she called from uh, the downtown Strauss, and said that she would meet me at my house early that evening. This was late afternoon that she called, and she said that she would meet me after she went to the European health spot in Boardman. Uh, she was to meet me, and then we were going to uh, go out to the Southern Park Mall for a movie. Um, she didn't show up. By Sunday, the word was out. No one had seen or heard from Joanne and everyone was praying that she would show up the next day at work. It was really weird. Um, I was waiting on Joanne and she was late. Well, of course, she didn't come to work, but um, a couple, oh, about nine o'clock, I guess, 
her mother called and asked me if I'd seen Joanne, if I'd heard from Joanne. I said no. And then about 10 minutes later, a girlfriend called and asked about her, and I said no. And then her boyfriend called. And so it was just, you know, there was a lot of people calling, and I was just saying I hadn't heard from her and asking what was going on. And, and uh, pretty soon everybody in the office was talking about her not coming to work and wondering where she was. It was pretty confusing. Were you worried? Yes, I was really worried because I thought she kept pretty close contact with her mother. And that day, Monday, December 30th, a distraught Mrs. Coughlin filed a missing persons report with the Youngstown Police Department. She was told it would take 48 hours before the police could begin investigating the case. Joanne's family and friends became angry that no one was looking into what had happened. So Joanne's boyfriend decided to take action. Called up the European Health Spa and uh, asked them uh, if she had been there. And they said, yes, indeed, that night she had been there. And uh, I went out and looked around the parking lot, looked around the grounds, drove around the Boardman Plaza, had friends of mine, legions of friends of mine, drive all over Mahoney County looking for the car. And, uh, Pollock found no trace of Joanne Coughlin or her car. And in the days immediately following Joanne's disappearance, the Coughlin family found no one in authority willing to listen. Everybody kept insisting that no foul play was involved in the case. And I, that Joanne was 21, that she ran away. That's what everybody kept insisting. I think maybe that's why the case went so cold. They really didn't take it seriously right from the beginning. Her little suitcase was missing in her hair dryer and her swimming suit, everything that you would take to the spa. Nothing else was missing. She had paid her life insurance that day. She sent it that day. She also bought a blanket for her bed down the street that day. And who would go and run away and leave $3,400 in the bank? The Joanne would just not pick up and leave and go somewhere without telling somebody. She didn't seem despondent or depressed or, or anything that would indicate that she would be thinking of leaving or going anywhere for some reason. While no one seemed to notice Joanne's disappearance except her family and friends, Joanne herself was always noticed. As a small child growing up in Newcastle, she was friendly and outgoing. She excelled in school and she soon became involved in numerous activities. In fourth grade, Joanne's picture appeared in Instructor Magazine demonstrating an art project. She learned to play the flute. And in eighth grade, when the family moved to Youngstown, Joanne moved to Adams Junior High, where she was able to make friends with ease. At Wilson High School, Joanne was nominated to the homecoming court, and she was voted co-captain of the majorettes. She joined the concert choir, the senior girls' ensemble, and the National Honor Society. She became a member of Wilson's Drama Circle, and she started looking towards the theater for expression. When she graduated in 1971, Joanne Coughlin took a job at the Jewish Community Center in Youngstown. She developed an interest in social work, and she was sent to YSU for a year of classes. But about a year before her disappearance, Joanne started to want more. She left her job at the center, took tap lessons, and became very involved with the Youngstown Playhouse, where she won good roles in Dames at Sea and The Last of the Red Hot Lovers. She always left you with a smile on your face. She was, she, you could tell she enjoyed what she was doing. She was uh, making the best of it every time she was on that stage, and she always put on a wonderful performance, always. The thing that impressed me most about her was her love of life and her humor. And she had the sympathy with everybody she worked with. Everybody loved her because she was just nice to be with. I think she was sometimes a little confused about what she wanted. I know that she was very into the theater. She was happy with what was happening in her life, I think. She was uh, getting involved a little more in the theater, a little more with people. Uh, I, I know that she had just moved out of the house recently and she was, she was starting to get things together. While Joanne was recognized on stage, inside she often felt like no one cared. Her close friends say a broken romance took its toll on her ego. She started to date a married man, and as she got to know him, 
she found out he had a past habit for heroin. Unbeknownst to her family, Joanne soon became acquainted with the local drug element, and her old friends started to break away. She seemed to be on what she saw as an exciting adventure, and she became intrigued with the other side of life. Two months before her disappearance, Joanne played one of the strippers in Gypsy. She received good reviews, and she began to have confidence in her abilities. By Thanksgiving of 1974, Joanne Coughlin had apparently grown tired of the nightlife, and her new rough crowd. She started dating former WHOT news reporter Dave Pollack. She felt good about their relationship. She seemed to be putting her feet back on the ground and she was pulling away from the underground. Believing that things were going good for her daughter, Mrs. Coughlin could not accept that Joanne dropped out. She worried something happened to Joanne because she had recently received a large traffic accident settlement check so Mrs. Coughlin decided to alert bank officials to her daughter's disappearance. On December 30th, 1974, Mrs. Coughlin called the Struthers branch of the Mahoning National Bank, where Joanne had a $3,400 savings account. And the next day, New Year's Eve, her mother's intuition proved right. A young woman drove up to the Mahoning Bank on Midlothian Boulevard in Boardman and tried to withdraw $800 from Joanne's account. The teller asked the imposter to come inside and call her mother. The woman promised she would call once she got to Florida. The teller then said the woman would have to go to the Struthers branch to withdraw Joanne's money. She never did. The bank manager assumed it was a family problem, but when he saw Joanne's picture in the paper with a plea from her parents, he too realized something was wrong. The manager up the bank here didn't call me for seven days afterwards to tell me about it. And he called me in and he says, is this Joanne's writing I, of the slip she signed for the money? I said, no, that's not Joanne's writing. And you took your daughter's picture up to the bank? I did, yes. Immediately? Immediately. Mm -hmm. And they said that was not Joanne. And the girl that came into the bank looked like she was on dope and she was dirty. And she had long hair and my daughter had short hair. On January 8, 1975, retired Youngstown Police Detective Herbert Campbell interviewed bank employees about the incident. Three days later, Campbell's partner, Detective Pete Delisio, says he heard from his source, who later led Delisio to the imposter. The woman told police she got the bank book from two men who waited at the Point Market while she tried to withdraw the money. The two suspects the woman named were brought in for questioning, then released. Neither the woman nor the suspects she implicated were ever charged. One day I called for Detective Camel to come in here. I said, uh, and he says, oh, I don't have time to come in today to talk to you. I says, well, I'm having that girl arrested today. Ask my husband, he was here within a half hour. And he begged me not to have that girl arrested. And I says, well, I'm going to. Him and Lyshen both had to talk me out of it. I says, I'm going to, and he says, please, Mrs. Coughlin, don't do that. He said they would like to keep her in the background, so if they found anything on those two boys she named, that they could bring her in as a witness. Well, I could never figure out why they couldn't bring her in as a witness and bring those guys in, just as she named them. But they said this would endanger her life. Well, how about my daughter's life? December Journal will continue. As late as last year, Youngstown Police Detective Pete Delisio maintained he was not totally convinced anything had happened to Joanne Coughlin. Even though the woman who posed as Joanne told police she got her bank book from Robert Shugart and Howard Rodriguez, two known figures in the local drug scene. Interviewed at his Poland Township restaurant, Delisio defended the decision not to prosecute the woman for attempted bank fraud in terms of a calculated gamble. She was an informant as far as this case was. I couldn't say she was an informant in the past. I could only say that another detective gave her name to me and said that he's been working with her. At the time police were looking into um, Joanne Coughlin's disappearance, the suspects the woman named, no. Shugart and Rodriguez, were already suspected of having knowledge about strange happenings within the drug underground. Well, Shugart's name was readily thrown about with the Gaudios and, and uh, other sources of very good, uh, Alexander, 
Wibley, Lamb, you name them, uh, their names were thrown in there. But, uh, Good Alexander, Wibley, and Lamb were all murdered between October of 1973 and the end of 1975. Joanne Coughlin disappeared December 27, 1974. John Robeck of Boardman also came up missing during that time, while Philip Maynor and Jeffrey Landau of Liberty came up dead. All of the victims were said to have had loose tongues or were found out to be police informants. Each killing is believed to be connected cases of retribution, and in many of the crimes, of which one is only officially solved, Robert Shugart's name has been mentioned. His name has been coming up as possibly involved in a number of murders. But there was nothing that I could prove or any other police officer in the outlying districts can prove that he's the actual trigger man on any killing. He is a suspected individual involved in it, but I cannot be emphatic and say that he is. But Rodriguez, all I, I could tell you about Rodriguez is that uh, where he lived, there was an intensive narcotics investigation going on at a particular time. It is likely that Joanne Coughlin may have met Shugart and or Rodriguez. Both men were known to her former boyfriend. Joanne had once gone to a party at Jeffrey Landau's apartment, and Landau was killed just 18 days after Joanne disappeared. Shugart told police Rodriguez lifted Joanne's belongings from a drug party in Warren. We contacted the uh, Warren Police Department Narcotics Division. They couldn't ascertain uh, what went on if there was, in fact, a party. And the only people that said that there was a party were the same people who were caught with Joanne's belongings. That is correct. So in essence, they just could have been covering themselves. That is a possibility also. Do you think they were? Well, at the time, no. I, I thought sincerely that there was a party, and this is where they did at, ascertain her, her objects. Police relied on the so-called party in Warren to explain why they thought Joanne Coughlin probably decided to drop out, minus her body or any physical evidence, and with the decision to forego prosecution on the bank incident, the investigation reached a dead end, that is, until the end of February 1975, when a call was made to WBBW's Dan Ryan show. <laughs> Okay, we're back in action at 11 minutes now, past the hour of 10. Good morning, you're on the air. I know that he has a large audience, so I did call Dan Ryan quite a few times. And the first couple times I called, you know, I'd give the information about the car, what color it was, the license number, which I had that information at that time. And he did receive one call from a man that said he had heard about a girl screaming in, uh, on the Villa Maria Road. The caller, George Vaparides of Lowellville, was responding to Mrs. Coughlin's announcement of a $500 reward. Vaparides reported that the incident took place around Christmas time on a dead end road off Villa Marie Road, straddling the Ohio Pennsylvania line. It is at this point that more discrepancies appear in the investigation. I went out, Detective Camel was off, a uh, day off, and I went out there and I spoke to. That was on March 4th, uh, 1975. I was out near the convent out there on Villa Marie Road and I spoke to five different families. And uh, they couldn't put anything uh, solid as to the, there was a girl screaming there. We asked who was home. We asked for their assistance and they were not able to, uh, they, they were in a position they would have heard a female screaming it outside, but they didn't. What would you say if I told you I talked to those same people and they told me that they did witness a screaming woman? They not only heard her, they saw her being dragged from a car. That is true, there was, but they couldn't say that this, is, this was Joanne Cogman. This could have been another incident. They told you that they did see something. Right. They'd seen an automobile, they'd seen a girl. Scream, I heard a girl screaming, but there was none that... This came up later from another source, but we were never able to ascertain that this was Joanne Coughlin. I was able to ascertain that the incident happened at 10 p.m. on December 27th, 1974. Would that lead you to think that it, it might have been Joanne Coughlin? What date? December 27th, the same date she was last seen. Well, that's possible, but uh, 
Although Delisio claimed the Villa Marie lead was inconclusive, he still had a few nearby quarries searched, looking for Joanne's car and possibly her body. Fearing her daughter would never be found, Mrs. Coughlin contacted the National Enquirer, a psychic, County Prosecutor Gil Martin, former Congressman Carney, a city councilman, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Each time, she was told that nothing could be done. A year and a half after Joanne had been gone, her mother persuaded Boardman police to look into the case since Joanne was last seen at a township health spa. Detectives George Statler and John Rosensteel quickly determined the trail did lead to Villa Marie Road. Uh, when we first went out there, uh, we talked to uh, uh, two individuals that were related. They saw a uh, car and what they believed to be either a pickup or a van. And they observed that the female was taken from the vehicle, the car, and taken back and put into the truck. Not lost on Boardman police was the fact that David Lamb's body turned up four months later, less than a mile and a half from the Villa Marie Road incident. They concluded Joanne and her car might be hidden somewhere nearby. And from that point, um, the Ohio-Pennsylvania line, as you know, is strung with uh, quarries of uh, probably hundreds of them in that vicinity. And by the time we were able to get to some of these quarries, some of them were uh, blocked off from the standpoint of uh, ro actual roadblocks being put up so people couldn't get back in. And it was a difficult thing to try and determine which ones would be open during the time frame that Joanne disappeared and we believe met with foul play and up to the time frame that we were working in. And uh, sometimes we were fortunate because there was gentlemen that still were working at the quarry areas that could say, yes, this area was open, or no, it wasn't. Many of these quarries are so deep and so cold that it's virtually impossible uh, to conduct an investigation uh, into, the, into the depths to determine uh, whether Joanne's car would, in fact, be there. Uh, the temperature precludes them from doing that. Uh, the depth of, of, uh, of these uh, pits uh, prevents us from doing that and it would uh, at this time uh, really take first-hand evidence somebody that was there uh, assuming that the car was disposed of in that fashion to lead us to the proper uh, quarry. So Tonight, five years after Joanne Coughlin was last seen, we can only speculate what may have happened. Perhaps she was met at her car in the spa parking lot by someone she knew and then she unwittingly agreed to go somewhere else from where she apparently met her fate. At one time, Boardman detectives considered the possibility of Joanne's bank account as the motive, but as time passes and connections are drawn to other disappearances and drug underground murders, it appears likely that more than money was involved. The possibility exists that uh, she might have overheard possibly something involved with uh, the people she was around at the time. Uh, also, that the possibility exists that uh, she might have been uh, felt that she was giving information to a local police agency. The possibility of narcotics transactions has always come up from the standpoint of uh, overhearing something, knowing something about certain individuals being uh, with some of the people she associated with. Ironically, finding out what really happened to Joanne Coughlin seemed destined to be buried in mystery and discrepancies almost from the start. And one big question mark is why did Youngstown police handle the case when Joanne presumably disappeared from Boardman and the attempted bank fraud also occurred in Boardman? You must understand that Detective Bureau was working on this case as the assumption this occurred as a mystery report in the city of Youngstown. Chief Baker, who was a command officer of the Youngstown Police Department, determined this investigation belonged in Boardman, Ohio. And it's stopped the investigation as far as we're concerned and let Boardman have it, but we gave Boardman our, our investigation up to that point. Delisio says with the accord of his immediate supervisor, he still pursued the case. But former Boardman Police Chief Grant Hess remembers for some reason Youngstown wanted to keep the Coughlin case, so Boardman stayed out of it. It was not until June of 1976 when the family requested assistance, the Boardman detectives started looking into Joanne's disappearance. As a result of information we've uncovered, police are now following up new leads. But unfortunately, five years later, the Coughlin family is still waiting for all of the answers 
and something called justice. I think this is going to be like another file that I worked on it since 1969. It's uh, legally declared dead now, but uh, it's an open investigation in the police department, though. Open. Never really closed, but That's collecting correct. a lot of dust. That's correct. So yeah. someone comes forward and might become involved in a crime, now wants to look for help, may admit something here that may be valuable information to this investigation. But without a body or a confession or an eyewitness to the crime, it will remain unsolved? It will remain on the Youngstown Police Department as a missing person unsolved. December Journal will continue. There are many more questions about the way the police handled the investigation into the disappearance of Joanne Coughlin. The suspects implicated by the woman who posed as Joanne at the bank, Robert Shugart and Howard Rodriguez, were never forced to give alibis for where they were December 27, 1974, the day Joanne Coughlin disappeared. In addition, police never looked into Joanne's former boyfriend's connections. Matter of fact, we had to tell police that he used to live in the same building as where they found Robert Shugart when they brought him in for questioning. After it was apparent that the decision not to prosecute the woman who posed as Joanne would not produce any additional information, neither the woman nor the suspects Shugart or Rodriguez were ever brought in for questioning again. The statute of limitations on the attempted bank fraud expires in just one year. Now, Andrea, the names of uh, Shugart and Rodriguez keeps coming up in the investigation. But where are they now? Both men are now in prison. They are doing time for crimes that Youngstown police say they used as pressure points in order to get more information out of them about what may have happened to Joanne Coughlin. The family has gone through this now for five years, exactly. Uncertainty, not knowing the frustrations involved in the investigation. What are their feelings right now? Well, they're a very strong family. They want to know the truth more than anything else. They accept Joanne's disappearance as her untimely death, but they say they can never accept the fact that whoever apparently killed Joanne is still getting away with it. Now, is the investigation still going on? Very much alive. We've produced some leads, which police are now checking into. We also urge anyone who might have any sort of information, no matter how inconsequential you think it is, to please contact the Boardman Police Department. It will be followed up on, and we will continue our investigation. Yes, we do have new information. We will be following up on that, and we will air that information and the new developments in the Coughlin case as it happens. We'll be back in a month on January Journal, but for now, for Andrea Wood, I'm Jack Bowe. Good evening. I had the sneaky feeling that something was sadly amiss. I said, I think the car's in the quarry and Joe's in the quarry. That was my first words to my wife, she asked me, and that's what I told her. We'd be talking about productions that we've done in the past, and eventually something like Gypsy or Dames at Sea would come up, and her name will be mentioned, and people will go into the same speculations that they went into long ago. Most everybody thinks that it died, you know, that people aren't involved in it, people aren't carrying it on anymore. After they got the proof that the girl had Joanne's bank book and charge cards and forged it, I assumed after that that things would take off from there, but it never did. And this girl still walks the streets. As to whether, to your eyes, it was a cover-up or uh, it was a jurisdictional dispute, which happens many times in our community with the outlying districts, as who, who, who does the investigation belong to. But with Chief Kerleski's approval, we continue to this investigation in hopes that we would be able to come to some type of conclusion. And we were just not able to. December Journal is a presentation of 33 Eyewitness News. Journal will return in January.